Good morning. Good to be here. Praise the Lord. Thanks for joining us this morning. Today we're going to talk about the godly principle of giving. Um, there's a lot of things in this topic. However, uh, we're going to try to cover them in uh, no particular order. Um, one of the things that uh, spurred this on my heart today was I was uh, reading about the uh, church in Laodicea. Uh, one of the things that I found amazing is that Laodicea was a trade central area for that whole region. And as such, it was an incredibly wealthy uh, region of the country. And yet, the only thing that kept the doors of the church in Laodicea open was a stipend from the Roman uh, government. It was like a Roman welfare that kept the, the doors open. And to me, that was desperately sad. So giving is more than just giving of finances. It's also giving of time. It's giving of your heart. There's a lot of different aspects here. So let's get praying and um, then we'll dig, dig right in. All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to get together as brothers and sisters in you to discuss um, giving. I know it's a controversial topic, Lord, but you know, I think it's one that needs to be addressed, especially as we have so many churches that are closing every year from uh, lack of involvement, uh, lack of resources, and so forth. And so, Jesus, today I just ask that you'll just bless the listener. I ask that the words will go deep into their hearts. And I pray, Lord, that, um, you know, a spirit of giving surrounds us all. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Let's start this morning uh, by looking at a character in the Bible by the name of Nicodemus. Why? It's because Nicodemus had a real keen interest in Jesus. Unlike most of the Pharisees and Sadducees who disdained and even plotted to kill Jesus, Nicodemus was fascinated by the truths that Jesus was sharing and the miracles performed at the hand of Jesus. Okay, Jesus wanted Nicodemus to understand his purpose and the gift that he would give to the world. Wonderful stuff. Just amazing. I want you to turn with me, if you have your Bibles this morning, to John 3. We're going to read verses 14 to 21. As always, I will read them, uh, just in case you don't have your word handy. Have your word handy. Praise God. All right. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Now, that means exalted, okay? That everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Okay? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Okay? Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of of God's one and only Son. Now recently we've talked about what that believed means, so we won't go into it today, but uh, if you um, haven't had an opportunity to review the previous sermons on this channel, please do so. All right, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Okay, everyone who does evil hates the light but will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God okay now back in John 3 3 Jesus tells Nicodemus something this is what he says no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. To Nicodemus, the Pharisee, this was confusing to say the least. He asked Jesus, can, can you be born of a mother two times? And Jesus takes compassion on Nicodemus and he explains to him that he needs more than a natural birth. Okay, He needs a spiritual birth as well. Okay. Now, Nicodemus is still trying to hard, at this point, to grasp what Jesus is saying. 
This is where we come into our scripture passage for today. Look at verse 14 again. Jesus says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Okay? This he understood. As a devout Jew and Pharisee, he was very familiar with what we call the Pentateuch. Okay? Now, the Pentateuch is a big, long, churchese term that simply means the first five books of the Bible. Okay? The books of the law. In short, he knew what Jesus was getting at. Jesus is referring to the exodus in the desert when Israel complained against God, and we can see that in Numbers 21. All right? This is when God sent venomous snakes into the camp. People were bitten, poisoned, and lay about dying. So finally the people repented to God, appealing for mercy, and he granted them life. I thank God for Jesus and the grace that we have to serve our God today. Now, God decided to order Moses to make a bronze snake and place it on a pole. If you think about it, it's kind of like the caduceus, right, used by medical practitioners today. Have you ever seen on a, a prescription pad or, or a medical documentation, they've got like a, a cross kind of pole and there's a snake wrapped around it called a caduceus? Kind of like that, okay? Um, when the people looked upon it, uh, they were cured. I think that's kind of one of the reasons why we see medical practitioners using the symbol today. Um, anyway, that's just my own theory. You see the message he, uh, he was a foreshadowing of what was to come. Jesus would be placed upon a tree right, in crucifixion, that cross, and whoever looked on him in faith would be healed. More than that, Jesus told Nicodemus that anyone who trusted in him would live forever. And yes, I know today's sermon topic is giving. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere, okay? You see, healing came when they looked upon the snake on the pole in accordance with God's grace. In this example, Jesus was drawing Nicodemus' attention to the gift that he would bring to the world. Okay? Finally, having placed this message in context for Nicodemus, Jesus went on to say in fifth, verse 15, and we know John uh, very well, it says, For God so loved the world, sorry, verse 16, that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Did you get that? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Now, I think we can all agree that that was a very sacrificial gift. Right. To me personally, this is the single most important line of Scripture. Because, for me, it's with these words that I understood what Jesus had done for me. And so I gave my life to Him. You with me? God gave me forgiveness and eternal life. I gave Him me. Oh, shock of shocks. I thought you were just going to talk about money. No, I'm talking about our lives belong to the Lord. When we are Christians, we give our lives to Jesus. Okay? Can you see the exchange? He gave his life for me, and so I willingly give my life to him. Now, this is not to be some kind of heretical drink the Kool-Aid and die sort of thing. That's not what I'm talking about. God doesn't want us to die that way. He wants us to live for him by dying to ourselves, dying to our sinful nature. So there's an exchange that happens there. He gives his son to us. His son gave his life to us and for us, and we give our lives to him. Now, as Christians, we get into this thing where 
I, I don't know what it is in modern culture, but it's really uh, hairy fairy. I don't know what else to call it. We, we, we get this, um, this picture of Jesus that requires nothing, that has no cost, no, uh, no value, other than we just accept it, we're good. The scripture says to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, and that's reverence and trembling. We're supposed to honor God. Okay? It's not about just, oh, I've accepted that and now everything's carefree and I don't have to lead a righteous life or anything else. I don't believe that. I believe that we're called to give of ourselves as a sacrifice to the Lord. Is it required for our salvation? It says, we just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not our works that saves us, but faith without works is dead. We've talked about that a number of times. So, as we go uh, about our lives, it's interesting that so many of us compartmental, co compartmentalize our lives. And by that, I mean put it into little chunks and little boxes here, there, and different pieces. Right? Like, this is me at church. This is me at school. This is me playing sports. This is me with my family. Are they the same person? This is me with my saved friends. This is me with my unsaved friends. This is me at work and so on. And so we compartmentalize these things. Guys, we're especially good at this. This is what we do. That's how we think. Okay? We set up ungodly boundaries, right? Because we feel that these things are to be kept apart. They're not. We're supposed to lead a Christian walk. The way I am in church should be the same person I am with my unsaved friends. You understand what I mean? I'm not called upon to just give a part of myself. God is our Father, and He doesn't just want weekend custody. He wants full custody of our hearts and our minds and, and who we are. Remember what Jesus said? He said, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and we are to do that and our neighbors as ourselves. But I'm speaking specifically about God here. So compartmentalizing and setting boundaries with God, which seems to be a pop popular topic lately, at least in my reading, is not scriptural. You with me? Now these things have come about because of abuses. They come about in abuses in churches. They've come apart uh, because people are trying to protect themselves. I understand protection. But I also understand that there's a commitment between us and the Lord Jesus. And we shouldn't be hedging our bets. We shouldn't be compartmentalizing. If I'm over here swearing and carousing with these guys one day, and I'm sitting in church saying, Hallelujah, praise God, that's a bit hypocritical, wouldn't you say? Right. So I'll let that challenge resonate. But we set ungodly boundaries because we feel that these things should be kept apart. That's where I had left off here. So let me carry on with that. Unfortunately, for those of us who have done or are still doing this, it's not what Scripture teaches. We are in sin. We need to repent and get back with God. Every aspect of our lives has to do with our faith. One of the things that I've noticed has fallen out of church in the last uh, 30 years that I've, I've uh, noticed it has been repentance. Going back to God and saying, look, God, I'm sorry. I blew it. I need to make this right. How often do you hear people saying, I'm sorry today? Not too often. Because they think of it as weakness. And actually, it's a greater strength. Now, if you look at these compartments that we talked about, these are avenues for you to share Jesus. I want you to think about that for a minute. Here I am with my friends. That's an avenue for Jesus. Here I am out on a biking holiday. Here I am, you know, camping. Here I am doing whatever. I'm, I'm doing uh, activities with my family. I'm fishing. These are opportunities when we come into contact with others, to share the good news of Jesus. If you haven't shared Jesus with anybody, why aren't you giving them that gift? 
are, are you taking everything to yourself but not giving back? See, I found that there's two types of people in this world. There's givers and there's takers. Which do you want to be? So if you're not giving in this way, ask yourself, why am I compartmentalizing my life? A lot of stuff I do in sermons is about self-reflection and looking inside. The Bible tells us that a man needs to examine himself. And so I'm saying, hey, you know, am I compartmentalizing my life? Am I assigning Jesus to just Sunday morning between 10 and, I don't know, 1130? Okay. Am I excluding, excluding sorry, Jesus from the other areas of my life? If you are, you're in sin. And you need to repent that and make things right with the Father. This morning, can we ask the question, have we really given our lives to Jesus? Or do we just let him have Sundays? Or just a portion of Sunday? Are we committed to God? Are we sold out to Jesus? And I'm... 100% behind the fact that it's a journey. But it's a journey that we have to choose to take. When we believe in him, are we believing in a committed fashion to him? Or are we just putting a knowledgeable kind of idea in place like we talked about last week? Kind of an abstract concept. Oh yeah, I believe he existed. That's not the same thing we're talking about here. How we live our lives and conduct ourselves at work, at home, at school, with family or friends is all done in the presence of God. If he never leaves us or forsakes us, he's right there. Now when we think about how we act in these compartments, do we realize, do we actually understand that we're doing them before the Father? Like, I've often heard it say, if Jesus was in the room, would you still do that? Well, yeah, he is in the room, so are you still doing that? I don't mean to be negative today. i got a lot to work on, too. But my point is, is that we need to be introspective. We need to examine ourselves. Are we giving our lives to Jesus? Or are we relegating him to 5 or 10% of our lives? I want to change gears for just a second. I want to change gears. This sermon is on giving and most people wait for the elephant in the room to appear. So with a nod to that aspect of financial giving, I do have a couple of things to say. I've been a pastor for almost 10 years now and before that a PK, a pastor's kid for at least 50. Okay, over the years I've seen a lot of differing ideas around it. You all know that I'm not a legalist on tithe. If you don't, I'm not, okay? I believe that the Lord loves a cheerful giver, and that's where it comes from, okay? Uh, the heave offerings, we give of our taxes to help the poor and the needy and the widows and the orphans and so forth. So we're all doing it through various aspects, okay? But the Lord loves a cheerful giver, Cheerfully giving of their time, cheerfully giving of their finances, cheerfully giving of their resources, cheerfully giving. And there's an overarching giving principle that must be understood. Please understand me. I'm not against tithing. I'm not. I support giving. I support regular giving. Without it, our pastors don't get paid. Our churches don't survive. That's the realistic thing about it. If we don't give to help support the ministry, the ministry can't be supported and it disappears. God uses people to give financially to help ministry. That's a simple fact. I mean, we can shake our head, we can bury our head in the sand, we can ignore it, whatever, but that's a truth. Okay? Resources come from people. If they don't, that's why we have 1,600 pastors leaving all the time. We have 
Church is closing all the time. We've got all these problems. Church shouldn't be working, worried about or focused on how they're going to pay the heat bill. They shouldn't be worried about how the pastor is going to eat. They should be focused on doing the work and the ministry of the Lord. And so, oh, our pastor shouldn't get paid. No, that's the wrong principle. A workman is worthy of her hire, and they're worthy of double honor, and so on and so forth. And I can quote scripture till the cows come home on this topic. But we need to understand that it is our financial support that keeps the wolf from the door, so the pastor and the leaders and, the, and even us, all of us, as a corporate body, as a church, can do the work of the Lord. That's the truth of it. Okay, you know me, I'm a straight shooter. How often have we considered what we should contribute, whether it be our time, our resources, our finances, whatever it might be? How often do we actually consider that? Do we ever pray about it? Do we ever ask the Lord, Lord, what would you like me to do? Lord, how can I be a part of establishing your kingdom here? How can I do this? Like, do you want me to listen? Do you want me to go around the senior center and just be a presence? Like, do you want me to contribute my finances? You know, probably the Lord is just saying, yes, 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 and yes, right? Whatever it might be, you know, just do we pray about it? I mean, we certainly think about finance a lot, but do we think about the other aspects of our life of giving too? We should be thinking about all of that. How are we being good stewards of what the Lord has given us? Have we sought guidance of the Lord regarding our finance? You know, there's the parable of the talents. Like, do we bury it? I don't think that's godly. You know, do we invest it? Do we do this? Do we do that? How do we cause these things to grow? Now, there's also talents, as in the talent of being an artist or being a musician or whatever, yes. But there's also talents where money in the context here. You know, do you put it in the bank so that you can reap the reward? I knew you were a harsh master. You know, like, what are we doing with the resources that God gave us? Okay, when we look at what the Word of God says, giving is always related to worship. It's a form of worship. Consider with me, if you will, Exodus 35 and 21. That's Exodus 35, 21. Here we'll see King David kicking off a project for the temple in Jerusalem. The people gave willingly, 1 Chronicles 29 and 6. Then when King Hezekiah restored the temple in 2 Chronicles 31.5, it tells us that the Israelites brought a great amount of tithe of everything. Now some will say, but pastor, that's Old Testament. Yet we can clearly see the same connection and the same principle applied in the New Testament. Consider the poor widow who placed everything she had in the treasury. You see... It wasn't about the collection of the pence. It was about her trusting God for her provision. That was the challenge before her. That was her test. She trusted God. Later in the New Testament, we see the Apostle Paul speaking to the people in Corinth, saying, on the first day of each week, of the week, sorry, each one should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income. Sorry, it might not be popular, but it's exactly what the Word of God says. There's a principle here of weekly giving. Now, most of us don't get paid weekly, so we get paid bi-weekly or yearly or monthly or whatever it might be. I'm talking about farmers, by the way, in the yearly aspect, because oftentimes when the crops come in, it all comes in in one swat, and you survive on that for the year. But the point is, is that we're supposed to set aside something to help. How many of us live at our income circle, right at the edge, where there's just enough just to make it? Truth. 
You know, sometimes we're right at the edge. Like, do we have enough to give? Do we do this? Do we do that? Do we, you know, and, and we, we have to say, okay, Lord, first fruits, this is for you. That's, that's the principle behind it. It's not about being legal or anything else. It's about just giving back to the Lord. Now, I'm using finance here as an example because it's a controversial topic, but it's also of our time. Okay? Many Christians I know uh, come to church one out of every three or four Sundays. What happened to giving that to the Lord? I'll leave that between them and the Lord. However, they need to be in the service. The Bible says, forsake not the gathering together of the assembly, as the manner of some is. So it's not a new problem. It's a commitment problem. Are you giving of your time? What's my point? Giving is not just an act of math to take care of basic needs. It's an act of worship. God doesn't just want your cash in the offering plate. He wants your heart there too. He wants it all. The thing is, is that people can get resentful or whatever, but he wants your heart there. See, your faithful giving is an outward expression of your inward devotion. And I'm talking giving of yourself, giving of your time, giving of your resources, giving of your finance. I'm talking giving as an overall principle. Okay? Do you believe me? Well, the Lord tells us where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know that giving is a testimony of relationship? I never thought of any of this stuff before. No, of course, because we don't hear about it anymore. Because people are afraid to say the truth. Well, I'm saying the truth. If your church is struggling, I'm not talking about just crossroads here. I'm talking about if your church is struggling, what are you doing? You remember Laodicea? What did Jesus say about this? I'd rather you be cold, warm or cold, but if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Like, are you there? Are you committed? Are you focused here? The actual fact of the matter is there's a warm spring coming into Laodicea and there's a cool spring and the mix made it disgusting. Right? But here's the thing, folks. Here's the thing. Wealthy city, wealthy people, wealthy churchgoers, Super poor church. So why is Laodicea a warning to the churches? I'll let that one just spin around for a while. So, now that part is taught, we come back to John 3.16. God gave his son Jesus Christ, who was all in, and I mean all in, he gave his life, he died on a tree, he was crucified, rose again, give us newness of life, but he was all in to be the savior of the world. He gave everything for you and for me. He did this freely. Not out of a sense of duty, out of a sense of love. We didn't have to fight with him to release the gift of eternal life by begging and pleading for him to send Jesus to us. God did the opposite. He loved us so much, he gave his son. There's a principle there. Parents, you love your kids. You stand ready to provide for them. The word of God says the man who doesn't provide for his family is worse than an infidel, right? So we need to actually get out there and take care of our families, right? Yeah, that's what we do. We give to our families. We give of our time. We give of our labor. We give of our love. We give of everything to our families. Why do we do that? Because we love them. 
You see the principle here? Do you see the parallel between this and God the Father? Now, if your kid is sick, you willingly sit with them to help them feel better. If you're like me, you will do anything and everything to help your kids because you love them so much. I'd take it on if I could, but you can't. The thing that I can't, I, I, I just, it's a hard trial for me, is when my kids get lethargic and listless. And you try to have the faith and you're sitting there, oh God, you know, I have faith in you, please heal my child and whatnot. I trust you, Lord, and everything else. But you're sitting there and you're still struggling and you're anxious for your kids. Why? Because you would give anything to them and for them because you love them. It's an expression of love. God gave his son freely. He came and took our place on the cross. Every one of us falls short of righteousness without Christ. We are wrapped in his robes of righteousness, and I thank God for it. We deserve death for our sin, and yet he shed his blood because of his great love for you. He gave it freely. He gave his life for you personally. He has redeemed you. You were bought with the price of his life and the shedding of his blood in sacrifice for you. Redeemed means to be purchased, to, take, to, to pay for it, right? He has propitiated you. Great big word, here's what it means. He took your place. He took the blame for your sin willingly and he freely gives his forgiveness to all who believe on him and simply ask him. Now, that's part of what's missing in today's modern theology is we do need to ask, Lord, please forgive my sin. He has reconciled you and me into right relationship once again with God the Father. You can now approach the throne of grace confidently. He has sanctified you. That means he's wrapped you up in that righteousness. That's that sanctification we talked about both instantaneous because of Christ's righteousness around us and ongoing because of the Holy Spirit's work, restorative work within us to bring about that likeness of Christ back into our lives within us. He is your high priest. He is your advocate before the Father. What he has given you and me is amazing. How can we as his disciples do anything less then freely give to our Lord's kingdom. When I think about it, and I think about the selfishness that I've had in my life and things like that, I can't help but want to make that right. I'm not talking about condemnation. I'm talking about a healthy conviction. Lord, you're right. I've only been giving you weekend time. I haven't been there. I haven't been supporting as I should be. I haven't been doing what I need to do. Convictions just make it right. This is not, or may not, be popular. But I have a responsibility to the truth. One thing you will always see me saying is what the Word of God says not what's popular. And maybe that reduces subscriptions, maybe it reduces numbers, but I firmly believe that if the message of the Lord is coming out the way that the Word of God says, God will bless it. It's my desire that every person here this morning is led to see and acknowledge what God has given to each of us, liberally. He's given us a lot, folks. Let's take a step back for a second and do a reality check. Psalms 24 verse 1 tells us that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Earth is the Lord's. He, he owns the earth. 
Everything in the earth belongs to God. Acts 17 and 25 says that our God is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. Everything that you have today, folks, God has given you. The sun came up this morning because God allowed it to come up. He put that into place. The air around the earth stays there because God created the plan to keep it there. You, out of all the myriad of seeds that had the possibility of life, were chosen by God and had life breathed into you by His will. Romans 8 and 23 or sorry, 8 and 32, sorry, little dyslexic moment there. And yes, I am dyslexic, whatever. One day God will heal me of that, but it's never stopped me, never prevented me from reading or anything else. So praise the Lord, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. But Romans 8 and 32 tells us that he graciously gives us all things. In the garden, you know, he gives us dominion over all of these things. But he wants us, as a good father, to understand the principles involved. Now, many of us know people that are takers. You know, it's never about giving back anything. You'll see them on the free boards of, I want this and I need this, an individual seeking this and whatnot for free. And they, 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 they want you to provide them with everything and they never help anybody else. I don't want to be that. I want to be like God. I want to be more like Jesus every day. He gave himself for us. Completely the opposite of that model. Now, we read Psalms 24, 1, Acts 17 and 25, and Romans 8 and 32. And if this is the case, and it is because what the word says is true, then we need to wake up and see that everything we have has come from him. Everything that you have today, your health comes from God. Starting with life and working down the list from there, it's all his. So it shouldn't be an issue. It shouldn't be controversial. When we understand these principles, it shouldn't be a problem. I'll be honest, I hate preaching on tithing and giving because it should be an automatic thing. It shouldn't be something where, where preachers are up there saying, do this, do that, give, give, give. I hate that. It should be, I have love in my heart and it comes out like this, because God loves a cheerful giver. End of story. But unfortunately, so many of us are not there. And so, even though I don't like doing it, God says, Ray, preach the whole counsel of the word. So today, we're preaching the whole counsel of the word. We're talking about the principle of giving. And I'm not talking about just your dollars and cents, although that is included. I'm talking about overall. It used to be people wanted to do things in the church. Hey, pastor, can I help do this for the Sunday school? Hey, pastor, do you need anything done here? Hey, pastor, can we help clean this up? Hey, pastor, we're gonna, can we have a church picnic? Can we get together? And now there's a sense of apathy in so many places, it's really sad to witness. Why? Because I think that many have forgotten this principle. God is a God of abundance. We are told that he came to give us life and that life more abundantly. This morning, are we faithful in the little things as we see in Matthew 25, 23? See, he will put you, he God will put you over many things when you're faithful in these little things. 
When your child learns principles and concepts and whatnot, you begin to trust that they understand it. Do you not give them greater responsibility? Do they not receive greater rewards? I believe so. I always have. You see, enter into the joy of the Lord. God blesses his people when they respond in obedience to his commandments. That's a simple fact. Let's take a look at the example of King Solomon from the Bible. Okay? Solomon prayed to God for wisdom. God's response was to give him amazing wisdom, riches, and a long life. Wow. Thank you, Lord. God gave it to him. He asked for it. God gave it to him. Why? Because he was faithful in the little things. How easy it is to forget that God set the sun and the moon and the firmament in place. The God we're dealing with here, the one true and almighty God, created the universe. Our God sends the rain, he grows the crops, he causes the sun to shine. And yet we we take for granted, I'm sorry, but there's no other way to put it, we take those things for granted. And if you don't, praise God. But I can remember a lot of days that I get up and I forget to thank God for that. I've learned to say, God, what's the day going to look like? But I still need to remember that the sun is shining, the air is around me, and I'm alive because God wills it. He gives that to me. A major work of the Holy Spirit is bringing about that likeness of Christ within us. I talked about that. It's a process in churches we call sanctification. Okay? Our role as disciples is to follow the discipline of the Master. Christ is our Master. Whether we like that phrasing or not, we are servants of God. If we're not, who are we serving? What are we serving? If we really think about what God has done for us and we look at the many examples of generosity that God has already given us, what should our response be? Should it be one of gratitude? What am I getting at here? Let me be really super clear. God is showing us the way through an example of the way we should be beyond generous uh, through the gift of his son. Friends, he gave us all. He gave us his all. And every resource, every ounce of our time and everything could not pay for one drop of his blood. The uncomfortable truth is that all we have is God's. Instead of giving from duty alone, or out of obligation, we need to embrace his joy in giving and be inspired by his gifts to us to be generous with what he has entrusted us with. God loves a cheerful giver. He shows us that he gives freely. He shows us that he gives liberally. He shows us that he gives sacrificially. He shows us that he gives selflessly. Do we want to be Christ-like? or not? Can we as Christians be generous by giving from our abundance? Can we as Christians be sacrificial by giving in lean times? Most of us struggle in this economy. This sermon is not about judging who can give generously and who can give little. It's not about money. It's not about resources. It's not just about time, although these are the realities. It's about our motivation. Are you generously donating time to build up your church? What about resources? What about your talents? Do you grudgingly give them to God? Or are you generously donating your time, your talents, your resources and whatnot to see God's kingdom established here? 
No one can judge your situation except you. And that's a caution I'm putting into this sermon. Don't be looking at your brother and sister and saying, oh, they're not doing what I'm doing and I'm going to judge them on that basis. It's not about what they're doing. It's about what you are doing between you and your God. Don't make yourself feel better because you make $100,000 and you give uh, 200 bucks, and John over there is on welfare and he gives five. That's got nothing to do with it. Are you giving your time? What's the motivation of your heart? Are you loving God? Or not? So don't judge others. No one can judge your situation except for you. So many struggle and have the abuses we see in the public media. We see that, and I'll be honest, when I saw that pastor that pastor and his son the other pastor at that church in the in at the coast and they scammed a bunch of people for money and took off with the money and uh, it was but a real estate deal and all that that makes me sick and i can say one thing with all assurity that they cannot believe in god because god won't allow that to flow there is a consequence but yet, we only see the scammers. We only see the negatives. Hollywood has portrayed the church in such a negative light that many of the Christians have bought into that package and are afraid to be givers of their time, to be givers of their talents, to be givers of their resources. It's, it's a fear, and we're allowing fear to take over our lives. I'll be honest with you, I gave up a six-figure career in business systems analysis. I don't look back. Let me tell you what happened. I came up to the Kootenays, no job, no prospects, nothing. I did have a job eventually. I arranged to have a job to come up through a, a company that I worked for. But I came up and I couldn't afford to do Bible school. I couldn't afford any of that. And the Lord laid on a relative's heart to pay off our house. Did I do it to get that? No. But I'm telling you that $250,000 asset suddenly fell into my lap so that I could do what God told me to do. You see, you can't outgive God. He will always take care of us. Always. And I have personal experience of that. It takes a long time to pay off a house. You get what I'm saying? I didn't give to get. I gave because God said it's the right thing to do. And then he blessed us. It's not a mansion. It's just a regular old house. But you know what? It is a blessing. And if we understand where those things come from, it's amazing. I'll be honest, as a pastor, I make about 25% of what I used to make. And even that's in jeopardy some of the times. Why do I say this? I say it for only one reason, not for sympathy, not for anything else, but to say, I had to trust God in deciding to become a minister here in the Kootenays. I'm not any different than any one of you. I struggle and have to pay bills, yet God has continually been faithful. Today, Economically, people will look at that financial picture and think I'm crazy. Don't get me wrong. My giving has not been perfect. Nor am I setting myself up as an example, because I'm not. I've made mistakes and everything else, just like anybody else. But I can share my experience. So why am I happier now than when I was making so much more money. I mean, I used to be able to walk into L&M and say, I'll take that guitar off the wall, or I'll take that amp, or I'll, you know, I, I'd get three, $4,000 paychecks every couple of weeks. It was easier. Bills were paid. I was comfortable. 
So why am I happier now than I ever was when I was making so much more cash? Why do I now have my house paid off when I couldn't do that before? Why do I now um, have the blessings that I have? How is it that I'm driving a, a, a new truck? How did I wind up with a 25 foot travel trailer this year, or actually two years ago, well below cost? Thanks mom and dad. You know, they, they, they sold it to me at, at a steal. How did I wind up with that? How is it that despite the difficult financial situations that tend to show up, I'm still richly blessed? And not just financially, but in my spirit, in my life, in my walk, in my growth. How can I be so much farther ahead now than I was then? It's three letters, folks. G O D. God. Giving to God joyfully, willingly, and lovingly brings blessing. It's not about the dollar amount or a percentage of income. It's not about a percentage of your time. It's not about building up a fancy church or anything like that. I'm a firm believer in the referendum. It's not about building up a fancy church. It's about relationship with God. It's about trusting God. It's about loving God. It's about showing worship to God by being sacrificial. May our giving be selflessly offered in gratitude and cheerfully. Consider that our amazing God, who so sacrificially gives to us, invites us to give back to Him. Consider the people in the Old Testament who lived as farmers. Suppose the farmer had a hundred acres of farmland. God said when you harvest your wheat, he wants the first fruits. This means from the first harvest, the first acre was given to the Lord for his purposes. They had faith. Why? Because who knows what would happen to the rest of the land yet to be harvested. Let's say you live in Calgary and you farm your land and, or just outside of Calgary, and the first 10% of your proceeds of the harvest goes to God. What if the other 90% is then destroyed in a hailstorm? Great big hails come down, destroy the farm. What if a migrating herd of elk eats the rest of your harvest of wheat? You see, faith is required. The reality is that true giving takes faith. Do we trust God to accomplish his will? Salmo, crossroads. Do we trust God to accomplish his, to, uh, to accomplish his will in Salmo? Will we be a part of making his will happen? Only God and we ourselves can look into our hearts and determine if we're giving out of duty, obligation, or out of relationship to God. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. What I want each person to take away from this sermon this morning is that giving is a form of worship. Giving can be generous or sacrificial and both honor God. God wants his people to be cheerful in their giving and requires faith and an investment in trust. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. That is scriptural, friends. <sniffs> giving from duty or obligation fills a financial need, but it doesn't fill, fulfill the worship requirement. Get what I'm saying? 
We should give of our time, resources, and finance and worship simply because of who he is and what he has done for us. I want you to think about this as more than a concept. Eternal life. Here's this globe on the shelf. It says eternal life. What's it worth? Let's look once more at what he's given us. As a church, in Selma, we have declared three things. We used to have a great big long sheet with a whole bunch of things and, and so forth, but really I've distilled it down to three things. We worship God. Will we worship him with our time? Will we worship him with our resources? Will we worship him with our finances? Will we worship him with our whole heart? We love all people. Doesn't matter whether you're black, white, red, yellow. I don't care what the color of your skin is. I don't care, right? Any of those things. Although I do care about social injustice and things. Please don't misunderstand that. I see us as equal, and I see that there are things that are not equal, and I think we need to stand for those things. We need to love all people and everybody. I once had a person ask me um, as a pastor, Pastor, are we going to allow that person, they smell like booze in the back of the church? <laughs> yes, of course we are. The church is not a cruise ship. It's a lifeboat. Welcome them. Love them. Make them feel like they're part of something. Connect them to the great Savior of the universe. And finally, the third thing is that we embrace community. And that's twofold in meaning. Embrace to hold fast to, to hug. We hold our community in Salmo, in Akutnis, in that area, in high esteem. We do what we can to help our community. We embrace our community. We put food into a food box every week that we're in service so that the food bank has extra resources coming in. We don't want people's stomach growling louder than the message of Jesus to fill their hearts. I'm not blowing our horn. I'm just saying that we embrace community. And the second aspect of that is is that we embrace the community of believers one to the other. We embrace our fellowship together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Do we have the capacity of a church to love all people who come? Yes, we'll do our very best. Will there be mistakes? Absolutely, there's always mistakes. But by the grace of God, let the intents of our hearts resonate. Are we able to help them when they need it? You know, as a pastor, I would love to have the ability to walk into my, into my office and have a safe and say, okay, I've got three cards in there and they've got uh, food from the food uh, uh, grocery store or whatever and, and give them to people who are in need. Sometimes that's not a reality if there's nothing coming in. Think about that for a minute. But by the grace of God, we could find ourselves being hungry. Oh, but pastor, there's the welfare program and there's this program and there's that program. Yes, but that doesn't alleviate us of our responsibility. And I'm going to be honest with you folks. I've been in the ministry long enough to see that there are people that fall through the cracks. Do those things abrogate us of our responsibility to be loving? No. Whatsoever you've done unto the least of these, you've done unto me. What does love look like? Agape love is unconditional and self-sacrificial. There's no expectation in return. Do we 
worship God every day or do we compartmentalize God? Does he hear from us only on Sunday morning? If he does, we need to change that. I'll be honest. How is your relationship with God? Do we trust him to superintend his church? Do we trust him to superintend his church here in Selmo or in Trail or anywhere else in our region? Of course, we need to trust God. But do we believe the vision he has established for his house? Will we be part of it? Or will we allow the world to cause us to fear? And so, stop us from being givers. Are we offering up our lives in worship to him? If so, what does that look like? Do we offer him our time? Do we offer him our finance to see his will done? Do we offer him our friendship and relationship? Do we pray? Do we read his word to understand him better? Do we offer our hearts full of joy and happiness to God? Do we allow him to be our strength? Is there a relationship there or not? Finally, do you know why I take up an offering when we have service, like right now we're distant, but do you know why I take up an offering crossroads on Sunday morning? It's because I will not rob you of the joy of giving. There is a blessing there. 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 and 2 tells us to make provision for needs. This is what it says. Now about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. It's taken care of. The needs are taken care of. I'm not saying that the pastor needs a $20 million house, a 40-foot yacht. I'm not saying that sort of stuff. But a person needs to be able to pay the bills. And they need to eat. Basic needs. The church is not about getting gilt golden pulpits and that kind of stuff. It should be about bringing into a storehouse, not to be takers, but to redistribute in giving. Malachi 3.10 tells us that the church is to pour out our blessings. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord God Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. See, there's a blessing This morning I want to share two last things with you. As important as this topic is, I don't want to know who gives what. Everyone is treated exactly the same um, regardless of their ability to support in my church. I actually step aside from that financial area so I don't know who contributes what because I will not be biased with loving the people. Everyone is treated exactly the same, regardless of that ability to support the church. I find out if we are up or down overall, and if, you can, if we can cover the expenses and overall total information. I find out if I'm going to get paid this week. I find out if I'm going to be paid this month. That's about it. Your personal giving patterns at Crossroads, by the way, I'm speaking to Crossroads, are not known to me, nor do I want to know. It's between you and God. However, there are needs. And if there's no support, there's no way to maintain continuation. That's the reality of the economy. I don't avoid taking up the offering for two reasons. I'm speaking directly to Crossroads now. This is your church and you are its stewards. And if you feel led, support us, that's great. 
I'm not asking for it, but that's wonderful. And two, I've discovered that giving joyfully brings blessings, and I don't want to rob anyone of the potential for God's blessing, your faithfulness. Friends, this morning I'm here to declare that you are loved. If you are a widow with two mites or a multimillionaire, you are loved equally. This sermon is about heart relationship and worship in all aspects of your life. Giving is merely one aspect of that, but a very, very important one. This is my testimony to you. I personally have never been able to outgive God. So what's my summary? It's really straightforward. God wants more than your wallet. He wants all of you. And he wants that full time. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask for each person who hears this sermon to be introspective, to look inside and evaluate where they stand with you. There are many who have been taken advantage of in this world and in some cases by what has been te deemed a church. Many have been used or abused God and it's a trap of the enemy to prevent them from receiving a blessing. In some cases, God, they've even been hurt by those claiming to be your servants. I pray, Lord, this morning a healing over those hearts. I pray, God, that nothing impedes the worship of any person in this place here today on this channel, God, in this uh, broadcast. I pray a breakthrough in the praises of your people. I pray a breakthrough of prayer in this house. I pray that your kingdom and your church not be used by the enemy or his children for their evil ends, but that what you intend your church to be, it will be. In Jesus' name, I pray this, and I pray an increase in vision and in faith in this house and on this uh, broadcast today. Today, I declare this church and its purpose and intention is to serve you, Lord God all morning, Almighty. Sorry, This morning, God, I come before you and I invite you to walk with each of us here today as we worship you in all aspects of your life. Lord, these are uncertain times, and I pray, Lord, that we will choose faith over fear. Both ask us to believe in that which we cannot see. But Lord, when we have faith in you, there is always a blessing. And so, Jesus, I just pray, Lord, that you will just bless each person here, that you will keep them in safeguard as they go from this broadcast today, God, that you will surround them with your love, that they will know that you are a loving God, that they can see all that you have given into their lives. I pray, God, that this hardness of heart, this apathy that has embraced so many of our churches will be broken in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that once again a renewal of our first love will occur. I pray, Jesus, Lord, that you will cause the hearts of people to support and love and, and, and finance and time or whatever it is, your kingdom. And Lord, I pray, God, that people will see the intentions here today, God. An intention to bring us to a form of worship. And I thank you for it, Jesus. And I just ask, God, for those that are working on the front line with this epidemic, I've been looking at the numbers this week, God, and to be honest, they're quite scary, but I refuse to be anxious because I'm placing my trust in you. But Lord, I'm asking you to keep those people in safeguard. I'm asking you to keep us all in safeguard. Break this pandemic in your name, God, I pray. And for those who have lost loved ones, God, I just pray, Jesus, your comfort and your love surround their hearts. I pray that your believers will surround them with love even if it has to be socially distanced, God. 
I thank you for it right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for being a part of this ministry. I just ask that the Lord Jesus will bless you and that he will sing over you this week and that you will feel his presence in a very real and very powerful way in your lives. God bless you all, and I look forward to seeing you here real soon.